So what I might do is, is I'll actually introduce all of our speakers and read out their bios as they come and take a seat up the front and then just introduce their names each time. And I think that might save us a bit of time and then coming up each time to give you the background on who they are. So I'll read them out in the order of, of their speaking. First thing I'm going to introduce Dr. Hugh Sadler. And Hugh, would you like a bottle of water? So, um, he will be the first to speak. Um, Hugh and his colleagues, he's been involved in analysis of major national energy policy issues in Australia and in the UK for over 30 years. And he and his colleagues actually wrote out a report that set out the strategy for ACT's greenhouse emissions reduction strategy, which was the least cost plan for getting to 100% renewables which the ACT decided to deploy the reverse auction for achieving that transition. And he's also been involved in writing reports for both the Sydney and Adelaide City Councils and is the author of the monthly SEDEX reports for those of you who read them. Could I also ask um, Andrew Bray from the Australian Wind Alliance, who I saw coming in the door. He's actually been up in the mid-north visiting wind farms. Andrew is the national coordinator of the Australian Wind Alliance, which is a not-for-profit group with a strong rural focus, which advocates on behalf of the community for wind energy in Australia. This alliance is independent of industry and represents farmers, wind workers, small business and community members who value wind power as a clean and effective source of energy. He's been involved since 2009 when he lived in Ballarat, most suitably, after a stint with renewable energy, now working with wind, He's made his home in Bungalore, north of the ACT, where he overlooks Joe Hockey's least favourite site. <laughs> Our third speaker on the expert panel is Lisa Lumsden, known to many of us, from Port Augusta. Um, Lisa's been living in Port Augusta for 12 years um, and has been chair of Repower Port Augusta a role now held by Gary Rowbottom, who I'd like to acknowledge is also in the room. So thank you for also coming down from Paul Gaston. Lisa was originally a physiotherapist and now a full-time mum of two children under five. Lisa brings her boundless passion and commitment to be a Repower Paul Gaston spokesperson and a local councillor. Um, she's been involved in the campaign since its inception five years ago and is dedicated and determined to deliver a new clean economy for Paul Gaston. I'm very also glad to introduce Mr. Darren Spinks, who's the Executive Chairman of Heliostar South Australia. I think we're very fortunate to have in South Australia at this time a fantastic example of a company, a manufacturing company, that's actively coping with a downturn in the automotive industry. So by combining the support of four companies, Precision Components, which is a car industry, University of South Australia, May Brothers and Enesol, Heliostat's used a grant from the Australian Government to look at really diversifying its role and looking at turning from being a car manufacturer into a range of high-tech end, which includes creating Heliostat's, designed by CSIRO. So if I could ask you to come up and start us off. Thank you very much for all the technical people who do things I couldn't possibly do. Thank you very much to Philip and all the other organisers for inviting me here to come and speak to this uh, gathering, which, which is very pleasant. Before I really get into it, I'll just um, uh, be a bit nerdy and answer um, Mark's uh, question about Estonia. The reason they have such high emissions is that they have a very large Soviet-era power station, the only one of its kind in the world, which burns crushed oil shale rock and, and exports a lot of its electricity, I think, to St. Petersburg, as well as being used in Estonia. A unique Soviet uh, achievement. <laughs> uh, now, that graph up there, uh, that's uh, from uh, actually uh, from my uh, the CNEX report, which I produce uh, every month, tracking what Australia's emissions are doing. That's a, uh, if people are interested in that, it's uh, published jointly by Pitt and Cherry, a company I work for part time, and by the Australia Institute. And the latest issues are available on either organisation's websites. And this is a graph from the uh, next issue, which will actually be out on Monday or Tuesday. 
And you can see this is I just tracked the energy part of Australia's emissions, which are 70% of Australia's total emissions. And what we do, it's uh, not quite all the energy because you can't get quite all the data, but most of it. And I track it in as close to real time as we can. That's just two months behind. And that's to the end of uh, uh, March. And you can see that all the sources of main sources of energy we use now, or fossil fuels we use now, well, electricity, which is made from all sorts of fuels, the use of petroleum products and use of natural gas are all now going up, and so total emissions are going up as well. And so, as uh, Stephen said, we're recarbonising when we should be decarbonising. We're in a truly disastrous uh, situation, really. So we've certainly got to make a big adjustment. Now, uh, I said I was very pleased to be here, and actually I have a personal reason for that, because I actually uh, was born and uh, was educated and grew up uh, uh, here, and I, I really like coming back to, to uh, Adelaide. Uh, and it actually also, uh, my personal history relates to uh, well, what I'm interested in, what I work on, uh, and uh, what we're here about today. I never thought it would when I was a child. My father worked in the electricity industry all this. He was a professional engineer and he was a senior manager in the electricity trust in the 50s and 60s and before that. And I can remember on one occasion, because I was a bit nerdy and interested in this stuff, we were coming out and talking about a colleague of his, I think this was in the late 1950s, had produced an internal report about the potential for using the wind to generate electricity in South Australia, and that was in the late 1950s. Would be fabulous if someone knew whether, whether that report still existed. Probably all the, the new owners of ETS are probably not since destroyed all those sorts of archives. But it was a definite fact, I can remember. And um, that, incidentally, well, not incidentally, it's relevant to what I'm going to, uh, to, to what we're talking about. That, that era we're talking about, 1950s through the 60s and into the 70s, was what we might call the sort of great era of building the electricity supply infrastructure we have today. And uh, it was the era of rural electrification, all taking electricity out to the country. And we built the framework of the transmission grid and the distribution systems we have today. And those are actually quite important because they actually support locations of lots of the wind farms. But uh, if I can move on to the next uh, second slide. <laughs> there we are. Sorry, sorry about all that. Um, the relevance of this, it's maybe a little bit hard to read, but the, um, the, it compares two periods in history. The uh, dark red and the blue bars are the period 1950 to 1980 of the Nash Australia, the electricity industry in Australia wide. And the, the blue bars are the gigawatts <coughs> total electricity generating um, <laughs> capacity. Uh, and the red bars are the amount of electricity. And you can see the rates of growth. And alongside it, I've put the, in green the growth of wind generation not capacity, but energy, in the last 10 years. That's why I so said the first three bars, that's a decade for all three but different decades. And you can see actually the rates of growth are even faster. So to, do, to achieve the sort of the targets that all the previous speakers have been talking about, what we need to do is replicate what the country did uh, some decades ago. I don't think that's an impossible challenge at all. It's uh, despite what the naysayers and the deniers say, it's really quite achievable. And I think uh, you can really learn quite a lot from looking back at history. And the other thing about history of that period, which is uh, somewhat relevant, is that when this started off, it was using, as Stephen said, 19th century electricity technology. All the main technologies used coal, uh, gas fired power stuff, or the coal fired power stuff, which date from the late 19th century. It was, it was a commercially mature technology. But one of the reasons that this growth was made possible, there was still incremental, steady improvements to the technology, got steadily cheaper, and, and they were able to um, bring down costs as it's expanded. 
There is no reason whatsoever to think that the same won't apply to wind and solar, which are now uh, technically mature technologies commercial and commercially mature. But that doesn't mean that they've stopped, that innovation will stop or start off in the industrial system. But I'm sure we can expect they'll keep on steadily getting gradually cheaper and cheaper. And so that, that will make achieving the sort of investment which is required even uh, easier than it might appear. Now, finally, uh, I want just to say something about the whole political uh, structure uh, and system that, that, that we need to make this possible. Uh, Robert, uh, I mentioned this and, and so did Mark about the national electricity market and the government structures. And I think anyone who thought about this knows we make, need to make some really far-reaching and fundamental change. I'll just make a couple of observations about the way the industry, uh, the structure of the industry we have at the moment. I think we need, it's important to think about it in two separate parts related to two bits of the supply system. One bit, when we talk about the NEM, the National Electricity Market, what we're talking about there is generation. And, and of course, that's where coal is uh, the incumbent and the renewable generation would come in. The other part of the system is the transmission and distribution. The key thing about the national electricity market as it was de um, designed and established in the 1990s in the, in the high point of you know, competitive, bringing competitive markets to infrastructure and so on, is that it's designed to be uh, competitive and to use the forces of competition to ensure the lowest possible costs uh, were achieved. To do that, they actually set up an amazingly complex system of rules which were designed to provide the incentives uh, which would hope would let private sector investment see the incentives come right for me to make an investment and the incentive had to be the one which said there is an investment needed to keep the system going to be able to deliver the electricity that the consumers require. It's a sort of indirect way of getting to the result that previously was done by the electricity commissions which were at it sort of themselves what was needed. The, uh, the other part of the system, the transmission and distribution system, still in effect works that way, but the investments have to be approved by the regulatory body called the Australian Energy Regulator. That is, the network businesses come along and say, we think we need a new transmission line here, a new substation there, some new poles down here, etc. And, and they make a case and it gets approved mostly by the Australian Energy Regulator. And the big problem that we've had over the last uh, 10 or 15 years is that there was not enough discipline by far and the rules in fact <coughs> encouraged them uh, to say they needed much more than they really did. So that's where the fault of that part of the system is. The fault, the fault in, the national, in, the, in the national electricity market system is that it was only ever designed to make small, gradual, incremental changes to what we've got and assume that we'd have the same technology. It just is not the suitable system that we need to bring about these very big changes. And so that's the debate which I, I know Mark understands the necessity for, and Robert and his party understand that for. I won't go into some different ways we could do it, but those are the sort of things that are beginning to happen, like with the ACT system that uh, uh, was mentioned, that where they a very small uh, jurisdiction with only a small amount of electricity consumption, but they sort of said, we want this generation, and effectively called tenders, it's called a reverse option, it's just like calling a tender, to move the system onto what goes, where also there's going to be the need for some strategic transmission lines and for uh, what are called other ancillary services. So I think we need to have much less reliance on this sort of artificial way of getting market forces and some more direct way of planning it. But we certainly don't want to get, go back to the old model of electricity commissions, and I'm certainly not advocating that. And the final point about the way the national electricity market was set up in the 1990s is that the state certainly couldn't agree and it was very much uh, in its uh, decisive action by the Commonwealth Government, which was the then was the, under the Keating Government, 
through the uh, Council of Australian Governments and then directing the Ministerial Council on Energy, or whatever it was then called, uh, to bring about this change. So basically it needed the feds to knock the heads of the states together and make it happen. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, Mark uh, well understands that and recognises that uh, if uh, and when he becomes the, the minister uh, or, or a responsible minister, that's what he will need to do with his colleagues. Thank you very much. transitioning the slides, um, when we come to the question and answer session, which we're hoping is going to be a lively and a major part of this event, um, just bear in mind that we're hoping to get questions about how can we actually help Australia make a transition. So as well as your pet subject, try and think big picture about what kind of policies we need, what do we need to shift when we come to the end of the election on the 2nd of July.
Um, and and wind now generates enough for every single house, the uses of every single house in the state, and then some. So it, it, it's really quite a significant project. Uh, project. Um, in that time, the emissions intensity uh, of South Australia's electricity reduced by a third, so 33% emissions reduction in, in that, just in that eight years. Uh, and, uh, and also it's worth noting, and this is something which is often lost on the, the sceptics, is that in that time, the amount of peak power that was needed, or backup, if you like, stayed pretty much constant, from around about 25% uh, through that whole time. So wind went up from 400 megawatts to 1200 megawatts, and the backup level of backup stayed exactly the same. So um, wind that wind at that level did not require an increase in backup at this um, uh, within the state. Um, wholesale prices were volatile in that period, but they were probably in line with what was happening in other states. So it didn't push up power prices. Um, uh, and, I th and I think it showed in a very concrete way that the rapid transition to wind is possible. Uh, and it's effective in reducing emissions and, and it's not at all expensive. Uh, so just mention that to the advertising and that's going to be run into them. <laughs> um, the, the other two points I'd like to make is that um, the shifted distributed generation that comes with greater wind power and indeed solar power as well um, is really a windfall to regional communities. So you move from a sort of hub and spoke uh, system. I'm originally from Victoria and of course all the power came from the Latrobe Valley and it all just went out. Um, all the investment in, and the jobs all accrued to this you know, handful of towns around Morwell and Terrell. Um, and, and that's where the power stuff happened. But now it's happening in Portland and it's happening in Warrnambool and it's happening in Ararat and it's happening in Ballarat and, um, and it's happening in, in Gippsland as well. Uh, and of course the same things happened here in South Australia. Um, and even to the point where uh, it's happening in places like New England, um, Glen Innes and uh, around uh, Inverell and North of up there. Uh, and that's enough for, um, for Barnaby Joyce to even notice and hop on board. And he's happily, happily launched a new wind farm in his electorate. <laughs> and said, look at the jobs, look at the jobs, look at the investment. And by the way, uh, more renewable in the system, energy in the system will lower wholesale power prices, and that's good for the consumer. So there you are. Man's had a road to Damascus conversion on that stuff because um, because of wind power, wind farms pay their way in regional communities. Um, I think I won't. I was going to mention some sort of numbers around um, a 300 megawatt project that's, that's going up near me at the moment, um, uh, near Yasser. It's a $600 million project. It's expected to create 370 jobs uh, uh, in the two-year construction phase. Uh, for New South Wales, it will bring uh, $163 million in, in economic value to the state, um, just a single project. Um, 35 ongoing full-time jobs for a place that really has very few jobs at all in it now that aren't agriculture jobs, which of course are dependent on commodity prices and they're dependent on the weather and, um, and a worsening climate. Um, and, and there's a direct injection of around $5 million each year through a community fund, through payments to, uh, to staff, to payments to local businesses, uh, and lots of those kind of things. And, and so those kind of things, and so that's one, 300 megawatt project and roughly uh, between now and 2020 we're going to have about seven of those each year and that's you know in different parts of Australia so that's that's a real fillip for lots of different places that have never had anything beyond agriculture before uh, so it's quite substantial uh, the final point I'd like to make is that we need to ensure that um, that communities are asking to host wind farms and they're not agitating to keep them out so that's something that the Wind Alliance is particularly interested in. How do we find, there are always supporters for wind farms in, in a community, but often, they're, often they'll keep a very low profile because the people who, who are against it, they're the squeaky wheels, you know. They get out there, they often really um, make the, the discussion around it very upsetting and, um, and difficult place to be. So any, you know, local in their right minds that, 
So I don't want any of that. And you've got to have real courage and pluck to stand up against it. So, um, so we try to, uh, um, we try to uh, encourage those people to do that. But, um, but the reality is that wind power has to go somewhere, and that means very large machines in farms. In, in around Australia. Anyone who's done the drive up from Burrow to Jamestown will know that um, that's quite dramatic, the number of, the number of uh, turbines that are up there. So there are a, a few things that can be done to make sure that happens. Uh, one is to make sure the community engagement is done really well. I think it's, I, you know, I think it's fair to say that in the early stages of wind development, there were some cowboys out there who took a divide and conquer approach to communities. I think that's now less acceptable and the industry has improved a lot, so I think that's, that's a step in the right direction. Uh, another thing that, could be, that should be brought on is increased sort of benefit sharing, if you like. So if you're the guy who has the farm with the turbines on it, your income might look like that. And if you're on the other side of the fence with no turbines, your income might look like that. And I think, I think sharing a little bit more is something which is starting to happen. The Canoa Bridge project in Victoria was one of those ones that did that uh, very well. Um, and also things like community ownership that we've seen at uh, Canoa Bridge at Hepburn Wind uh, and developed sort of ownership sharing between developers and communities is also, I think, something that's worth investigating. So that's where I want to leave it.
power stations to you know, reach the end of their life because they won't actually get there um, as our nation and the globe transitions into the future. Um, and I suppose the, the key point in terms of what I sort of feel like I represent here um, is about the power of people um, and that together, um, you know, it's not just been our group by any means, um, our group's been part of a bigger group, the Red Power Port Industrial Alliance, and then we're linked with a whole bunch of national groups and connecting to connected. Um, and we have had a lot of support um, from a lot of groups, but, but you know, we, we are trying to be proactive. We, we're not just saying we don't want coal, we're saying what we want and we're finding solutions and we're being proactive about redefining our own future. Um, and, uh, and you know, we've really had a really good response. Um, but to me, it's about momentum. Um, and we sort of, the things sort of started getting a bit of momentum, but as policies um, have changed or we've had different prime ministers, there's been such instability um, and, um, and we have really seen that affected, uh, affecting the, the number of people that have taken an interest in our town. And since, you know, the rent stabilised, um, we have, you know, I'm on the board of the City Council and I know that about once a week on average our, our um, council is approached by people who are interested in investing um, and building renewables in our town. Um, the land all surrounding our town is all getting signed up um, for promise for people to, to build on and um, so it's really promising future but in order to get that over the line, to get to start seeing stuff being built we need policies that support it. We need arena grant funding um, more than any, more than most things, um, and um, and certainly a continuation of the renewable energy target. Um, uh, and I think uh, recently I did hear um, you know, that the, the, one of the major issues I think is that we we often hear is it's about someone finding someone to buy the power, and the current state government has an expression of interest um, out where they have called um, for for um, low carbon. Um, companies to provide um, new low, low carbon electricity to, to supply the state government um, and uh, we still are waiting to hear the outcome of that um, but we certainly hope to hear um, soon and um, I hope that, South, that Port Augusta um, will be um, benefiting from that but we'll have to wait and see. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's been quite a, a, a roller coaster ride, it's certainly been a learning, a uh, big, big steep learning curve for me. Um, and there's certainly been lots of tears um, and excitement along the way um, as we've had the highs and the lows. And I hope to s hope soon we will um, have a very big high. <laughs> Um, we've never even heard of a Helios that. And um, 
one month, five, five weeks later, we, we formed a company. And uh, we've been learning you know, plenty about each other as we've gone through the journey over the, over the three years. Um, you know, even today, Cliff um, comes in and he's got the other director there, and the, the blend of the of Helios Data Say, which involves automotive, um, you know, research from um, University of South Australia, they're a shareholder, research and environmental background from Enesalt and a project management from a, from a Maze Brothers point of view, and we're continually challenging each other. And as a, from an automotive um, point of view, you know, researchers and environmental um, background people are just you know, I've had to say this to, to Cliff and, and the other and um, our other director, who's um, you know environmental and product director. Just I can't absorb any more of your of your information. You know, <laughs> it's, you've got to actually. For me, I'm trying to balance environmental. I'm trying to uh, balance transition, but also to make sure that it's commercial. And that's that's another thing that we've that we've got to we're, we're faced with. And um, you know, we've got a few ideas on that. The, um, so, you know, a little bit more about Helios Data Space, and we concentrate on our number one um, uh, product is Helios Data we, um, we have a license with the CSIRO Australian Technology. In fact, um, uh, we just finished a, a commissioning a Helios Data Ray field in Yokohama, Japan, for Mitsubishi Itachi Power Systems. Um, and that's on the, on the back of you know, Australian technology and engineering, etc. Um, CSP leaks are concentrated solar power uh, with PV, and that's another one that needs helio stats. Um, your, your lower tech um, PV installations, and, and I'll get to the reason why we're in that and what the opportunities for that and why we've targeted that also. Um, but the, the learnings and are really come about, and the most exciting thing is the, the opportunities that are associated with the renewable industry itself and what, what it can play. And the opportunities for development and national development, okay, in particular, something that I'm passionate about, which is, which is industry, okay? And I'll give you a couple of examples. The uh, proposed um, solar reserve facility up at Port Augusta is proposed, it's not, it's not over the line. But just from a heliostat um, point of view, it's, it's about 40% of the, the, the project value, just roughly. It has about 40% of it, and it's about 30,000 tonnes of steel just in, in those heliostat field, okay? Now, to give you some, some example or, you know, a little bit of background, how much steel that is, they talk about the submarines and, and how important that is and how good it is for our, for our steel, steel industry. We talk about Port Augusta losing the, the Alinta, and we talk about Moala and, and Arium steel mill and, and all those type of things. The actual amount of steel of 30,000 tonnes equal to about eight submarines, okay? And that steel, you know, is, is, can be produced and provided, and if it's provided locally, then it also means that it's got to be manufactured locally, and it creates industry locally, okay? And that's, that's a crucial thing. The other thing I'll say as well is making sure that, it, that Australian content and involvement in these, in these projects, okay, is, is crucial, okay? The, the, there's a 200 megawatt arena round under application for, for PV installation, okay? Now those 200 megawatts, that's another 14,000 tonne of steel, okay? But, if we, but in those programs, the, the policies and the selection criteria need to take into account the, the long-term benefit associated with involving local content to develop our own capability so it can reinvest, et cetera. So that 14,000 tonne, that's only 200 megawatt of PV. Okay, and there's another three submarines that can be done. And that's only a short period. So there's a massive opportunity, if the policies are right, to make sure there's an involvement from an industry point of view. And industry, as well as they, the, the industry, as we see it, is if we can build our capability. So we just don't want to be involved in the, in the, in the projects themselves just from an installation point of view. And I, we fully understand that we need to have international investment and international partners with appropriate technology and bankable technology to, you know, to, uh, and there needs to be a mixture of that. But there also needs to be a strong mixture about the involvement of Australian industry 
to develop our own capability so that we can not only produce the projects in our own right, in our own nation, but also export those opportunities. And that's where the long-term jobs are, are really going to be. And we look at it from an automotive point of view. Transition, you know, we're, we're, uh, we would consider ourselves an expert at transition. We know how difficult it is. That's what, how, that's what expert we are. We're expert in understanding the difficulties and the challenges and the duration. And you know, winter, 18 months, that's, um, you know, that's not bad. We've had, we've had three years, you know, and, and I really feel for the, for the, for the people up at Port Augusta and, and you know, the, the potential issues with, with RM. So I think not only as an Australian nation, but also regionally and local, we need to work together to make sure that we can help each other out in, in right across, okay? You talk about that, that PV, and I'm, just, I'm not going to half on it, but there's a real possibility that 200 megawatts of PV, which is supported through arena funding, and, and arena funding is important, there's a real, there's a real case and, and a real, it's not a threat, it's, it's a real possibility that that 200 megawatt, which is supported by arena and federal money, etc., is going to have overseas product. Okay, and over, which involves over, overseas steel, which means the, the jobs and the capability are minimal going forward. The, um, um, I think the, the other thing, we talk about 18 months and we talk about three years from the automotive industry, it needs to be quick. Okay, so even in, in our case, we've we'll had a, a red off crack at it, okay, we're not even nowhere near there yet. Okay? And we see great opportunities. And in fact, you know, talk about auto and new business and manufacturing, there's nothing on the left-hand side. All our interest is on, on the renewable side. And all we hear about and we see these opportunities, but they do need to happen quickly. We, we, we just can't hang around for, for three to four years on a, on, on a, on a whim or a, on a great idea and it sounds good, but all the rest of it, it's going to be that commercial reality to make sure that we can keep going with it. The, um, I think the, the other thing that we've learned very, very um, quickly and the value is industry research collaboration, which is another key part. Um, you know, an example of that is um, Heliostat SA in conjunction with CSIRO technology, in conjunction with Precision, which is the, you know, the auto manufacturing and engineering expertise, is, is delivering that, that product in Japan for, for Yokohama R&D test field, which is based around concentrated solar power. Now, they want to get in it, and they're using Australian technology and Australian engineering, okay? But Japan is no, is no good for their next demonstration site. So, you know, there's, there's real IP and real talent and real capability that we can develop very quickly, and we can attract that to Australia <coughs> if everything's, you know, set right. So, um, I think, Probably enough for, from me. Um, it is Friday night. I've got annual leave, and I was to be honest with you. I was coming here. And I was thinking, I, you know, I'll be nine o'clock, and I'll be, you know, I'll be at nine thirty. I should be home, and I'll be on my holidays. Then, but every time I come to these events, and every day that I listen to Cliff, or I listen to other other people that have got a real passion around environment, um, you know, as equally as I do about industry, is uh, you know, is uh, you know, quite. Um, very interesting, but it's quite harrowing too, because I was trying to soak it all up. But uh, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, all the best.